Hello, everyone, and thank you for um, making time to attend our webinar. My name is Jessie Bertolotti. I work for International Education of Peer Encapsulations. I'd like to start off by just apologizing again for the issue regarding our last webinar. As we all know, these are very unusual times, and due to constantly changing regulations surrounding the situation, we have unfortunately needed to change our approach. Um, therefore, we would like to bring you the most recent peer encapsulations Coley Connection video, which discusses best practices in unusual times. We are playing this webinar in order to give access to all of our international practitioners that are in all different time zones. Throughout the replying with our recording, we will have Dr. Denise Furness, who will be able to answer questions. Please put all questions that you have in the chat box. We will conclude the video with a lengthy live question and answer session with Dr. Furness. And before I begin with the recording, I'd like to introduce Dr. Furness. Denise Furness, who has a PhD, is passionate about helping practitioners and patients navigate the new and evolving world of nutrigenomics and personalized medicine. She began her career as a research scientist focusing on folate nutrigenomics methylation, and DNA damage in relation to pregnancy health. Her research has since expanded to vitamin D, inflammatory, and metabolic-related genes, and biomarkers. She's a published author and has won numerous awards for her research and conference presentations. In 2012, she founded Your Genes and Nutrition, applying her knowledge to private practice and working alongside some of Australia's most prominent integrative medical doctors. And without any further ado, I would like to hand things over to Dr. Burnett. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Jessie. Um, as she said, apologies for the last webinar. We were all excited to go, but things are changing. But I think you're going to get so much from this, particularly those of you who don't do any consults online or are currently moving to that online model, and I think all of us will be after this. There's some really valuable information um, in this particular webinar. Um, and also in that little intro from Jessie, she said, I started my career in, in nutrigenomics around sort of folate and methylation, but actually, as you will hear in this webinar, um, I started in virology. However, most of the time when I'm now working with functional medicine doctors, and in this world of um, you know, health, I don't really talk about um, what I was doing before I moved into nutrigenomics. So feel free to ask me questions, um, you know, anything to do with sort of virology, because I do have some knowledge in the area. Also, this is a recording of our most recent webinar we did together, but you are welcome to send through questions because I'm here. If you've got a quick question about something that is said, um, I will open this chat box now for all of you looking at that. You've got that chat box. You can click on that. There it is. It's open for me. So I'll keep an eye out on that chat box. If it's a quick question that I think won't ruin the flow of this webinar, then I will stop the webinar, answer your question, and then we can get back to it. If it's something that I know I'm, we need to discuss further or um, there's a few questions and we need to elaborate, we'll wait till the end. But feel free to send your questions through and I may answer it during, during the webinar, but if not, definitely at the end. So enjoy, I will start the webinar for you. All right, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. We actually have someone with us from Australia. It's Friday morning there. We're so glad she could join us. There she is on screen. Uh, and thank you to everyone who could join us today. I know that a lot of you are international. You're all over the world. So we're so glad you could be with us today. Uh, this is our third colleague connection. Uh, this is a live event where we gathered a, a, a panel of three experts on screen before you to discuss your questions, your comments, and to discuss the most pressing topics of today, namely the pandemic for the most part. Uh, my name is Paul Larkin. I am a content manager at Pure Encapsulations and I'm your host today. Um, before we get started, and I do wanna get us into things as quickly as we can, there's a brief disclaimer that I have to go through. And the disclaimer is that this seminar is for educational purposes only. 
It is intended for healthcare practitioners only, and the opinions of our panelists are their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the company. So we haven't told these panelists to say anything. We've asked them to join us because we know that they're experts in a wide range of things. We think they'd be great candidates to answer your questions, but they're here uh, on their own free will to say what they wanna say. So with that said, please let me introduce you to our three panelists today. We're joined by, let me click the slide, there we go. On the left-hand side of this slide, we're jo joined by Dr. Daniel Kalish, who is the founder of the Kalish Institute, which is an online training program established in 2006, dedicated to building functional medicine practices. He has a lot of experience building functional medicine practices and the business side of things. Dr. Kalish joined the practice implementation faculty for the Institute of Functional Medicine in 2017 and began a strategic partnership around My Practice Plan, which is a hands-on course, a hands-on online course focused on designing an ideal practice plan. I mean, I think before we actually got started here, we were all talking about um, you know, running a practice and how it can sometimes turn into something that you didn't want it to become. Um, and so Dan is here to help us talk through designing an ideal practice. He's also uh, an author of three books, a notable speaker, uh, and you'll likely see him at many uh, um, important conferences throughout the US and abroad uh, lecturing. So we're so glad he could join us today. Welcome, Dr. Dan Kalish. Thank you. We're also joined by Dr. Denise Furness. Dr. Furness is in Australia. Uh, she is passionate about helping practitioners and patients navigate the new and evolving world of nutrigenomics and personalized medicine. She began her career as a research scientist focusing on folate, nutrigenomics, methylation, and DNA damage in relation to pregnancy. But over the years, her research expanded to cover vitamin D, inflammatory and metabolic-related genes, and other biomarkers. In 2012, which doesn't seem that long ago, but it actually was, she founded Your Genes and Nutrition and began applying her knowledge in private practice, working along some of Australia's most prominent integrative doctors. So welcome, Dr. Furness. We're so glad you could be here. I can see the sun rising behind you. I know it's yeah. early there. Thank you. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> And then last but certainly not least, we're joined by Kara Ware, who is a pioneer and leading contributor to the field of functional medicine. She excels at improving patient retention and clinical outcomes, two things that we all desperately need in our practice. And her coaching skills and deep understanding of the patient experience make her an important asset to any functional medicine practice. Kara's 14-year personal journey began with her son, who has autism, and by addressing the underlying medical and lifestyle factors behind this condition. In 2013, she opened a functional medicine autism recovery clinic and achieved such tremendous results that, in, that she was uh, joined by Dr. Nathan Morris uh, in his practice, Good Medicine, as his clinical coordinator. Kara has uh, also been the Pure Genomics Business Integration Coordinator since 2016. Kara Ware, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Paul. All right, guys. So the way that this is going to work, to all of you, our attendees, if you haven't been to one of these things before, the way that this will, will work, we will give each of our panelists about five to 10 minutes to present. So they, they have some prepared material with them, um, what they think you should know about this pandemic, what they'd like to share with you. And then after we've had a chance to hear from all three of them, we will open this up to questions. Um, so you should know how to answer a question because we're gonna have a lot of time to answer questions. Um, and that's really what this event is gonna center around. So if you would like to, answer, uh, to ask a question, we encourage you to use the questions feature on the GoToWebinar control panel. So you'll see comments, or excuse me, you'll see chat and you'll see questions. If you have a question, please use the questions feature. If you have a comment, and we'd love to hear your comments as well, in our past colleague connections, we've received some really great comments which we take from that chat feature and share with the rest of, of you because um, you know, we've got three experts here, but I, I'm sure that there are many, many experts in our audience who can share with us some things that are working for them. So if you have a comment to share, please include that in the chat and we will uh, call attention to those comments that we think are worth sharing. Um, and that's how we're gonna do this. So we're gonna start off with uh, Dr. Kalish. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, let you present your material and then we'll go from there. All right, thanks so much, Paul, appreciate it. You know what it just occurred to me? One of the great things about doing these things online is that there's no more hecklers. Remember back in the day when we had live audiences and they're like, you can't really heckle me. I can just, you know, anyways, it's kind of funny. Okay, so oh, I got it. Like, I'm trying to take it. Yeah, Denise and I will heckle you. <laughs> you know, I've, I've, this 
this is the most stressed out I've ever been in my life, except for when my son was in the NICU. That was like a bad week, you know? So oh. I just want to acknowledge that this is like a horrific and like, I'm making jokes because you, you can't even really wrap your mind around what's happening. And I think my response to that has just been to work compulsively, which is maybe not the healthiest thing. <laughs> so um, well, part of what I'm trying to do to keep myself sane is reach out to other human beings. And we're doing this at events like this. And I'll talk about my story a little bit and how perhaps I can help other doctors. I've been on the phone all day, every day for quite a while now, maybe almost a month, trying to help other doctors figure out how to transist from an in-person clinic to telemedicine fast, right? Because this isn't like this long-term project you're gonna spend three to five years on. And just a, a little bit about my background, you know, I, I um, transitioned to telemedicine full-time about 15 years ago. So my whole practice has been online since then. And it's a really great way to practice. The overhead is low. You can help a lot of people throughout the world. And it's a great model. And then uh, through the Chaos Institute, we've trained hundreds of doctors in how to do this. So this is a doable project. You can take a deep breath and realize, hey, people have been doing this for a long time, veterans like myself. And there's whole communities of people springing up now that are trying to figure out how to do this relatively quickly. Um, yeah, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Yeah. And I think that the um, the... The, well, my dad was a social psychologist, right? So he his whole career was oriented around uh, death and dying and um, working with people who are dying. And so is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had these stages of grief, which many of us are familiar with. And I feel like this is kind of what we're going through on a global level, right? First of all, it was pretty much denial. And, and now we're somewhere between anger and depression and acceptance. And I think the important thing to realize is that it's not just us that are going through this, it's like the entire patient community that we serve as well. And so what I'm seeing in my telemedicine practice now is there was this absolute week or two where every appointment was canceled. And I was like, okay, game over. My telemedicine practice is going to be done. And then this week, we're adding extra days because people have come out of this shock phase and they're like, holy moly, what am I going to do to strengthen my immune system? Where am I going to look? How am I going to make this, you know, they're in this acceptance phase, right? They're like coming out of this fear place and realizing that they better take some action in order to get themselves healthy. So I think we're hopefully, depending on where you are in the world, you're going to see patients going through this as well. And that we have a great opportunity here to offer telemedicine services using functional medicine to people who really need it desperately. Okay, the next slide. Um, and then we're also, um, just so you guys know, that I, I started a free telemedicine Q&A call, and we're doing that twice a week. You guys are welcome to join. It's at the Kalish Institute. You can just click on classes and go to the free class. Um, and we're doing that twice a week and just answering questions like we are going to be doing today. Okay? And some of the, the slides that I put together today are based on the most common questions that I've been getting in our free telemedicine class that seems to be... Um, you know, the things that are people are worried about the most, you know, in order to how to get started. So um, how do you actually do this, right? How do you intake a new patient virtually? And the simple solution to that, and Karen may get into this more, is you can use programs like Living Matrix, okay? So it's all set up, it's all online. You don't need a piece of paper and a pen. It can all happen virtually, okay? So that's an easy way to get started as a uh, intake process. And then how are you gonna transition from an in-person patient setting to telemedicine. We'll talk about that in a second in a little more detail with some specifics about how you can do that. But the most important thing is to focus on your existing patients and reach out to them and let them know to tell their friends, family, that you're you know, starting a telemedicine clinic and that you want to really help people and you want to be able to offer these services. Um, the next thing to really think about, and this is complicated and probably won't happen in the, in the first few weeks of you doing this, is uh, how are you going to keep patients engaged? You know, if you're a chiropractor or acupuncturist, you keep people engaged by saying, come back next week for another treatment, right? Or, you know, if you're a family practitioner, there's just like natural ways that this all happens. And on a tele in a telemedicine practice, you have to make up ways and reasons for people to engage with you. And that can be done. There's many different programs that are out there that help facilitate this. So just so you know, you have to think a little bit outside the box in terms of patient engagement. And then... 100% of my 15 years of success in telemedicine has been ordering lab tests. Most, all the lab companies that we work with are still open. They're desperate for business. There's not a problem there. And you can have lab kits drop shipped right to people's homes. And that ends up being the key motivator to get this engagement process started and for people to want to start on programs and follow up as well. Okay, next slide. And so if you want to get a little bit more into the granular level, like what are the things you can do right away? 
and again, in the free telemedicine class, we're going through this hour after hour after hour. This is just a short summary, okay? But the first thing that you should do is get your email list, and hopefully you have one, and start to put together a sequence of five to seven emails. Each one with slightly different content that's valuable, but each time you're reminding people that you're starting a telemedicine practice, right? Or you're transitioning, transitioning to telemedicine. And then make sure that you offer something free in there so people can click on it. And what we're doing with most of the practices that I'm consulting with is just offering a free 15 minute consult to patients. So you can tell them what you're doing online and how it's gonna work. So there's no risk for them to sign up, it's just easy. And it's kind of a no-brainer, right, for patients that trust you and know you. And make sure that you also, you know, let people know that you want their friends and family to be joining this telemedicine practice as well. So you can start to get referrals in this way also. And then on the free consult, really what you're trying to do is convince them that they should do a lab. I mean, the easiest thing to do in these times when everyone's stressed out of their mind is, you know, let them know that you could test their adrenal hormones and start to look at secretory IgA levels and how to strengthen their mucosal immunity. First line immune defense, that's where it's at, right? So if you're stressed, your mucosal immunity weakens, you're going to be prone to every bug on this planet, not only viruses, but bacteria, yeast, parasites, et cetera. So a simple adrenal panel opens the door for you to set up a program, a nutritional supplement program, lifestyle program to de-stress them and strengthen their immune response. So that's an easy, not, not very expensive test for people to do, right? And they can do it from home with saliva or urine samples. It's really straightforward. And then you set up a consultation for when the lab comes back. Now you have something to talk about. Now you have something to charge them for. Now you have some a reason to put them on a program, a reason to start to order supplements, and a reason to engage with them on the lifestyle changes as well as with supplements. Okay, uh, next slide. I mean, I do a lot of other testing, but we're trying to keep it simple here for those of you that are just getting started. And you can you know, obviously add to this as things go on. And then if you're, again, sending out this series of five to seven emails and letting people know, hey, friends and family, let's get some new patient referrals coming in. And you're gonna then offer a free 15 minute consult to a potential new patient. And during that consult, you clearly don't wanna diagnose anything you don't want to treat them. You don't want to offer them any kind of solution, right? What you're really doing is just developing rapport. And there's a few simple questions during that free 15 minutes. You should spend maybe five to 10 minutes on these questions. When did this problem first start? What else was going on in your life at that time? So you allow that person to start to talk about the origins of their health problem and unload a little bit of all the strain that's on their system so that you, know, you can listen, be a good listener. You don't even really have to say much. You need to just engage them and seem like a compassionate, decent human being, which we all are, right? And um, once you're in that five to 10 minute zone and you feel like you're starting to get to know this person at least a little bit, then you can do what I call the condition description technique, which is you say, well, you know, I understand you can't sleep, for example. Let's say their main problem is they can't sleep. I understand that you can't sleep. And you know, I think that a lot of the stress that we're all under is playing into sleep problems. We're seeing this in a lot of the patients that I work with. I think it'd be a good idea if we tested and corrected your cortisol because that controls your sleep cycle and is very sensitive cortisol is to stress. And so, and again, you're talking to them about why they should do a lab test and getting them into this world of doing a lab so that you have something to follow up with them about and something to work on in the future going forward. And these labs, when they're done right, um, when the lab consultations are done well, you know, you have lifestyle stuff you can talk about, diet and exercise and meditation. You have supplement programs you can recommend based on the adrenal labs. And you're really often running with a full program that's stress reducing, sleep enhancing, immune enhancing, et cetera. Okay, next slide. So again, it's the same basic structure, right? 15 minutes for your existing patients, talk about an adrenal lab, get them to do it. 15 minutes free for potential new patients, talk about an adrenal lab, get them to do it. You know, or fall into whatever pattern you want. You can use other tests, obviously. I just think the adrenal labs are the most often, the most obvious. Now, some people are very practically oriented. Some doctors are, I'm not gonna use the word paranoid because that's like kind of a negative, but um, highly concerned about regulatory bodies. and you know, since this virus hit internationally, the whole world has kind of thrown up their hands and said, every doctor should do telemedicine now, right? A lot of the HIPAA rules have been suspended. A lot of the state to state, you know, rules have been suspended. And so we're in an open era now where telemedicine is being widely accepted. You definitely need to talk to an attorney. You don't want to get thrown in jail or violate any laws that cause you to lose your medical license. But just be known that 
everybody wants us to do telemedicine right now, okay? So this is the moment if you're thinking about it. And there's some, a couple of HIPAA related things you obviously want to deal with if you haven't already. HIPAA compliant Gmail, they have a fancy version of Gmail, it doesn't cost that much, you can get that. And then the use of a health coach, right? And this is something Karen and I have collaborated on for quite some time now and really starting to get into how a health coach can help your practice. Perhaps that person might do the free 15 minute consults if you get a high volume of people so you don't have to do them all yourself. Okay, so getting some front office systems together. Back office systems, usually you're gonna have to be, be able to sell things online because people can't come to your clinic right now. All the companies that we work with have online ways to dispense supplements, that's not too hard. You wanna get some patient communication going, an app if you're like fancy and tech oriented like I am, or even just you know a simple maybe once a week Zoom call or go to webinar call webinar call that you do for patients so you can reach out to people. It's really easy to be HIPAA compliant in terms of files. We just store all our patient files on Dropbox, and we don't have a fancy you know system by any means. It's very simple and something you can set up inexpensively on your own. Dropbox is easy to get and doesn't cost that much money. And then in terms of how the people get lab kits, you drop ship the lab kits from the lab right to the patient's house, you track the systems. And then the most important part of this and probably what takes the most amount of time, um, and it's probably gonna happen you know, maybe for all of us in six months or a year, is really robust follow-up systems. So as these existing patients come to your telemedicine practice and as new patients start to flow in, you're thinking about sustaining this practice getting past this next couple months when we're all just worried about cash flow and realizing, wait a minute, maybe kind of like Dan, I could just do this full time or half time, or maybe when my brick and mortar clinic opens, I'm gonna keep doing telemedicine two days a week, right? That's probably gonna to happen to almost all of you because it's a really great gig to work on the phone a couple of days a week. And so think about more long-term follow-up systems that you may wanna put in place that are similar to the kinds of things that you put in place in your clinic, okay? And so those are just some quick tips I want to turn it over to our next expert. Uh, I think Kara's up next. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. thank you, Dan. That was wonderful, practical, very practical advice, business advice for our listeners. So thank you. Uh, Kara, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you. All right, so uh, I'm Kara Ware, and um, I started out as uh, Paul said, well, in functional medicine 14 years ago. So I've been around a long time, both as a parent of a patient, a patient myself, and then as a health coach, and then an expanded role of a health coach as a clinical coordinator when I became Dr. Nathan Morris's business advisor, as well as health coach, and now as a business integration coach. And I've been enjoying this business integration coaching so much because uh, the providers also their their personal journey is fascinating what's led them to their practice and it's all a combination and so um, go ahead and to the next slide paul so when we're talking about our patients we're really also talking about ourselves and this is this slide is just stating the obvious but let's go a little bit deeper into it and similar to how dan brought up the stages of grief i want to talk about the stages of change and then what motivates these uh, modifiable lifestyle factors. These are very action oriented and action, we get locked into thinking that change is all about action. And so therefore it can quickly, functional medicine can quickly become overwhelming um, for everyone involved. And the truth of the matter is, is there are a lot of prerequisites that come before placing um, anything into action. And so we need to think about things, we need to prepare for things, and then that makes the action easier. And even more so than the stages of change that James Prochaska gives us in the trans theoretical model, we also need to think about what are our motivators? What are our values? What are our needs? Why do we even want to move in this direction of um, improving our modifiable lifestyle factors? And so right now, why we're home and we're homeschooling and we have far more responsibilities every day and we're being pulled in in many more directions, which I didn't even think was possible, <laughs> but now it is. <laughs> um, we really need to distill down our lifestyle to the basics. And I think this is a good reminder for us as we communicate with our patient population that this is incremental steps. And so let's start feeling really good about what we can do. And the more we look for what we can do, and the more that we look at what we feel good about doing, then we're naturally gonna look for more. And so as you're developing and pivoting and moving into a telemedicine and everything things changing and rapid change can feel scary and overwhelming and you're working like mad, like Dan said, and I, I'm right there with you. Um, 
you know, we need to remember to stop and look for the tasks that we feel really good about and that are within our ability. Because a lot of times we'll feel like there's a task that's outside of our ability and it can create paralysis. And this is what your patients are feeling. And so when we take a step and look at the incremental baby steps and make it a game, I make it a game with myself. What can I do that's so little that I would feel really good about and build on success? What strengths do I have right now that I can put into place that I would feel successful. It's all about building on success. And so as you're re-engaging with uh, maybe patients or reaching out, like he was saying in an email, you can talk about stories of what you're doing. You know, that human connection is going to be more of a driver to your practice than any force or fear or facts about the pandemic right now. It's going to be you sharing your anecdotes and your personal stories of how are you maintaining balance and what are the small steps that you're doing so that your patients can feel like they can relate to you. And that's going to be that human connection of why they're going to work with you even more than just being that medical expert. So, um, okay, Paul, next slide. And then, of course, mental health right now is um, challenging. You know, our environment is of pervasive stress and loss of structure and unprecedented unemployment right now. There's a lot happening that's making this perfect storm for this epigenetic influence on our gene expression. And so just simple nutrients, again, and I'm going to talk about in the next slide, but just simple nutrients that help to support us being able to access the dopamine and have a sense of feeling well and safe so that it, hopefully it'll prevent us from um, tending to dip into to some chronic eating or, or drinking or addiction, like, you know, reward seeking behaviors. So again, that mental health is just breaking it down into really incremental steps of how can I take good care of myself right now? That's a question I ask myself regularly through the day is how can I help take care of myself right now? And then that steers me to, um, to, a, to performing my work, whether it be personal or professional, in a way that creates an atmosphere that's healing and healthy for everyone that's involved. And your patients are going to feel that radiating from you, and they're going to want to come close to you because that's how they want to feel. Okay, Paul, next step. So these are uh, where I'm at with my personal LLC, my CaraWare LLC. Um, you can find me at carawarecoaching.com. So I have been doing a lot of business integration coaching, like I mentioned earlier. Dan sends me a lot of his students, you know, so, uh, very similar to patients. We have all these moving parts, all these components to our lives. I like to uh, refer to them as the stars. And sometimes it's hard to put the stars together to form the constellation, the big picture, because we're so close to them and it feels sometimes confusing especially under pervasive stress it's almost that we just can't grasp the picture that we know is right there in front of us but it just feels unreachable for some reason um, because we're stressed <laughs> and so what i like to do is i hear their vision i hear why they're even in this i hear what they want i hear what's motivating them what's important to them and then i tell them that back to them and they have all you have all the answers the providers have all the answers the patients have all the answers but just speaking to someone that knows um knows the journey and knows the process of change and then hearing it back i watch these providers have these aha moments like oh that's how i put it together oh my gosh i see it now and there's nothing more enjoyable for me than uh, those aha moments because you have all the answers within you. So the business integration coaching is just a service. I've really enjoyed working with Dan's students because he's giving them all these tools. I mean, the way that he's consolidated and organized the information in his My Practice Plan and Telemedicine Essentials and the Mentorship Plan is, inc is so fantastic. And then I just come alongside of him and really put that in, into um into action. And then the nutritional genomics, this is something you're going to start hearing uh, Dr. Morris and I talk a lot about in our podcast that we're launching May 1st. So that's coming up, Good Medicine on the Go, uh, where we take his practice, Good Medicine, and we actually take it from brick to click um, in a real-time series. I think it's going to be Functional Medicine's first kind of a reality show where we take his practice virtually um, and more importantly, openly for all of you to see. We'll be sharing our business integration tools along the way and how we're doing this, our triumphs and our challenges along the way. We'll be having experts come into place, but we'll be using nutritional genomics as a driver because what is more relevant? Um, our family. 
and what 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 is a motivator? It's our family, and um, we can really draw upon the momentum of the ancestry kits and take that a step further and look at their genetics and steer um, and then break that down into really small steps of what we can do next and use that as a motivator of labs. Dan uses labs as a motivator. We're going to kind of take a little bit of a different angle. So of course, there's a million different ways to do this, and we're just going to share one way. But I do uh, offer integration consults again to take a look at how do you integrate and where do you start and how do you begin your learning curve, especially if you're new to this. A lot of practitioners communicate they feel very overwhelmed and they know it's important, but they feel a little intimidated to start with nutritional genomics because it's out of their scope of study. And so what are some really tangible, concrete steps that you can do to get started in your practice utilizing this tool in concert with your other um, clinical decision-making tools is something that I offer and specifically with pure genomics as well. Um, so to know how to use that tool. And um, with the business integration coaching, even with the nutritional genomics, with the podcast, we're going to be talking about the technology we use. You know, we rely, as Dan said earlier, a lot on Living Matrix. Living Matrix is coming out with some phenomenal features. They are working on a scheduling component and a HIPAA compliant video conferencing um, uh, feature as well as a COVID-19 risk form, which is actually going to use the CDC criteria and uh, take a look at your current patients and your living matrix database, look at their current symptoms and the forms that they filled out and extrapolate those patients who are at high you know, could could potentially be at high risk. And then you can reach out and re-engage them, not by fear, but just saying, hey, this is a really great time to come back and revisit your functional medicine life and see how we can break this down so it's accessible to you in a way that feels um, uh, affordable and that you can uh, build on success uh, because now it is really important uh, more than ever. So go ahead. I don't, I think I have one more slide. And um, again, you know, I was asked, what am I doing uh, in my life to create diet and lifestyle balance? And um, I'm as much as possible, I'm supporting local businesses, local CSAs and local yoga studios streaming online. I think that's a really a neat um, silver lining that's coming from this is that we can bunker down and support our communities more than ever through the various online uh, services that they're having. And you're one of those. And so that's another way that you can uh, engage a new audience or reactivate old patients is to talk about supporting local businesses and that we're all in this together. And um, so, um, yeah, those were just kind of some things that I've been I've been working on. Uh, whenever I notice I'm feeling overwhelmed, it's a it's a definitely a sign that I just need to stop and walk away and stand in front of a window and just take a couple deep breaths. It's amazing, just the simplest, the most simple things can be the most effective. Is there another slide, Paul? I don't think so. I think it's Denise. I All right, Denise, you're up. Karen, thank you so much. I I just wanted to reiterate one thing that was really powerful, and and I'm definitely going to start doing this. You said. You, you will ask yourself, how can I take care of myself right now? And you ask yourself <laughs> that on a regular basis. I think that's phenomenal. That really stood out to me. So uh, I'm going to take that with me uh, from this webinar. Awesome. Um, yeah. All right, Denise, you are up. All right. Good morning, good evening, afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, if you want to just jump into the, the slide and we will go from there. Or well, before even with the with the the slides i will just say that before i started working in nutrigenomics so in 2003 i moved from virology actually um to nutrigenomics so i used to work in um, a pc4 lab at csro australian animal health laboratories which was the only place up until recently that had done live vir like sars work um so actually my old colleagues are the people that are working on this right now with vaccines um doing a lot of research and so I worked at a lab where we used to train for outbreaks. So I actually know a lot about viruses. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about what I'm doing. But one thing right now is I'm actually doing a lot of free videos just to try to help people be a little bit calmer about all of this because I noticed Dan's sort of stages of, of change. And I guess because I'm a scientist, because I've worked in virology, because I have been exposed to this world, this was not that unusual for me. So, you know, there are outbreaks all the time. It's that in countries like Australia, we don't hear about them. We have such good diagnostic laboratories like SARO that look after all of the Pacific area. 
we have great hospitals and health cares. And, you know, in the time, that short time that I worked in virology that few years, there was a number of outbreaks in Australia, in, v in Vietnam, all over. But people don't hear about them because they're generally contained very quickly. Um, they don't spread. But I think for the majority of the population that don't really know this is happening, this was a really big shock. And obviously it's, it's got out, it's a pandemic. That's not normal. I mean, outbreaks are common. Um, but for me, there was no denial. There was no any of those things. So I was really shocked when I started seeing the behaviour, particularly in Australia. We're pretty, I like to think, relaxed, loving, caring people. I mean, that's really generalising, but it's been really sad to see the way that many Australians have responded. Fighting over toilet paper, fighting over groceries, there's been this real, like, protect myself. It's... It, I'm shocked. So if anything that has shocked me and given me anger and grief, it's the behaviour. I've tried to stay neutral and not show my emotions, <laughs> but by doing a lot of videos um, that are just based on science and evidence and trying to be objective and understanding that these people are so scared. I, I shouldn't be angry at them. I, you know, this is, this, is, this is terrible that they've got that much anxiety um, and they're, they're that emotional that, that they are behaving in that way. Like, how scared are these people? The fear is absolutely terrible. And so I am trying really hard one-on-one -on -one with people, um, with family members, with patients, and then to the wider community doing these videos to let people know it's okay, we'll get over this, and uh, it's not as scary as what some people think. So anyway, I said I was going to jump into the slides and just gave you that little spiel. So just know that I do have some experience with viruses. I spent years sequencing them. I've characterised novel viruses. Um, but then in 2003, uh, so the work I was doing moved into animal work and I'm not okay with that. So I looked for a new area and found out about nutrigenomics. And I was like, oh my God, this is my calling. Like I was into nutrition and exercise and I was like genetics with health and personalised health. So I... Uh, I um, moved into that area and have been doing it now for nearly 20 years. So talking with coping with change, I'm the type of person who gets up very early to train. So for example, I was about to do a triathlon at the end of March. Not that that's normal, but I've always, you know, I'm generally fit, I'm exercising. And so I'm up early, I train, I work during the day, sort of meditate at night. There's a, there's a fair bit of routine got two young children, I take on a lot with, with work and um, generally cope pretty well. <laughs> but this has been um, a different experience. As an optimistic go-getter, I um, kind of was excited about the kids staying home, as strange as that is. I was like, oh, wow, I'm going to homeschool and we're going to cook every day and I'm going to make sure they do this and I'll set them up with tasks, you know, and then I'll do a few hours work and I'll just let you know that, you know, on day one, I realised that is not going to happen. <laughs> day one, guys, not a week or two weeks, day one, I was like, wow, I can't work. So my husband was also sick, by the way. Um, I think everyone in, in part of, you know, this the pre presenters all know that, but my husband, unfortunately, has been quite sick. I was concerned I brought something back from New York. Um, and generally, he's my number one support, so he looks after the kids in the house. So I, I felt like a bit of a single parent as my husband was in bed for a few weeks, very unwell. Um, and, yeah, so I, very early on in the piece, we've had the children home now for four weeks, decided just to let go of all of that. I thought the most important thing is just as you know, Cara was saying too, like mental health and how we're dealing with this. And I thought, you know what, I just need to let it go. Let it go. And um, I want the children to be happy. I need them to be fed <laughs> and clean and get through the work that I need to get through. So I've actually um, closed my virtual doors. So I'm 100% online as well. So last week, it was really two weeks ago, but last week I announced it officially. I've been doing a lot of rescheduling and things, but last week I officially have closed my doors. And a lot of practitioners have said to me, God, you're so lucky that, you know, you're online. But the reality is even for those of us who are online, most of us now have children at home or another partner trying to work from home. Um, and that comes with challenges as well. And in saying that, when I decided to close my virtual doors, I actually put a video up explaining to patients because some of them had been on the waiting list for some time, like months, since like December, and were expecting to be booked in in March. That was the information they had from admin. Um, 
but I explained to them that I need to do what's right for me and my family and also they need to think about what's right for them. I think everyone under the, under these circumstances understands. But I did a video and explained a bit of some of the things that Cara was talking about. What can we do just to take care of ourselves? I'm making changes in my life um, to suit these kind of circumstances. Um, so you can see there, it's I'm allowing myself to have a break. Um, when I say have a break, I'm still doing this kind of stuff. I've got, you know, webinars next week for Hong Kong and the Philippines. I'm still having meetings, but I'm just not seeing my patients, which is sort of my part-time work. Focusing on minimising stress, definitely. You know, I haven't really snapped at my children. I, uh, week one, my daughter, who's only three, came in and um, I did get grumpy. I snapped. That's the only time I've snapped. And that's actually when I started thinking I need to stop the patient work. Um, I don't want to have that kind of negative, like there's already enough going on, but I have spoken to some people sadly that are, you know, having these issues every day with their children and that's such a terrible environment. So I would say to people, you know, don't put that pressure on yourself. You know, like Cara said, what can you do just to make things easier to take care of yourself, whether it's a bath, a bit more sleep, changing habits so that you're in a bit more of a peaceful sort of situation. And as I said, I was way too optimistic about everything that I could do, <laughs> and I am only human. And even for people like me that usually think I can, you know, do everything, it's it, it's a tough time. Um, but some of the great things that have come out of this is because I do so much travel, um, I don't sort of reach out to local farmers or get organic food delivered and things like that because a lot of food gets wasted. Um, so I am someone who works from home, but I, I travel a lot. But now that I'm home, I've been able to, you know, find out I actually live in a rural area a couple of hours from the city and I've got like someone down the road that, um, you know, I'm getting food from, from local people. So it's all organic. And if it's not organic, it's stuff that's not sprayed. These people care about the earth and the bacteria and the dirt and goodness speaking to them, they're so passionate about food. So I'm really grateful that I've connected. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have it in the States, but we have a you know, everyone's on social media, there's a local, so for my suburb, we've got a local community group and I was able to find some of these things through the local community group. So there's all these people talking, people are, as much as I said, there's some bad behaviour, there's also some people doing lovely things like posting, does anyone need groceries dropped off? You know, can we do this kind of stuff for each other? So there is a nice side as well. I think it was more just the initial fear probably about a month ago that really was was concerning. Now people are calming down a little and there's a bit, of, a bit more kindness. Um, so yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting great food um, from local producers. I'm doing these free videos, as I said, trying to help with education um, and thinking how I can help more people, um, you know, and also trying to live more sustainably. You can go to the next one, thanks Paul. Yep, so I said before, PhD was back in 2007. Um, I then moved from research into clinic in 2012. I was seeing patients in a clinic, in a medical practice, working with uh, integrative GPs. And um, basically what was happening is I started connecting with a lot of doctors and I was the person, because of my genetics background, would be helping them interpret genetics. So there was a lot of sort of functional medicine doctors that were doing nutrigenomics testing, but not really understanding. So I would often sit in and just help with that part. And I started doing a lot of that through Skype. And I will be honest, initially, I wasn't so comfortable with the online. I'm a very, you know, like to be with people in person, but soon it became quite, quite comfortable. So it just sort of happened like that, that people were saying, can you Skype? And, um, then by the time 2015 it's there, I was actually only doing one day in the medical practice, uh, a physical day seeing patients. Um, so I'd really moved to more online and that was great because it opened up patients from overseas and interstate. And then in 2018, we moved here from Melbourne and now I work 100% um, online. So, so that has how it's happened for me. I haven't been as organised as Dan and sort of probably had all of these wonderful systems. It kind of just happened and I didn't plan. It kind of happened. I was a bit responsive. Um, so I'm also using this time to think about how I can do things better. You can go to the next slide. So for me, I use um, an online resource, Clinico. So that's great. It's for um, you know doctors and practitioners, and that's where I store all the patient data. 
um, all the information, the notes, the testing, things like that. I use Zoom. Um, I used to use Skype. Um, when I yeah, I plan to use a better appointment system at the moment. I'm sort of sending out Zooms, but I'm physically doing it, or my admin, which is my husband. Um, but I want to set up some sort of calendar where patients can go in and, and do that. You might have something like that on your course, Dan. I'll have a little look. Um, I do a lot of online. So I guess I come from a science background. I do genetics. Dan was talking about keeping patients engaged. I don't think I've ever had that problem. As you can tell, I love to chat. I think they're engaged, whether they're engaged or not. <laughs> um, but I guess because I do do so much testing, that is my model. That's how I do things. So it's a lot of it, nearly everyone does genetic testing, but we're doing Dutch, we're doing organic acids, we're doing this, we're always trying to get to those things and developing programs based on testing. So for me, um, that's my model anyway. So that definitely works well. And I obviously have an online dispensary. So since leaving the clinic, I definitely do not want to stock products. I don't want to have those costs of buying them and then having them here and having to ship them out or you know things expiring. So I do everything through an online dispensary. Um, and then I get some little mistakes that I have made. Um, you know, if you do get a virtual receptionist, I mean, if you're already an established clinic, you probably got some reception support, but I got a virtual receptionist and it wasn't the cheapest. It was actually an organisation in Melbourne that specialised working with integrative doctors and allied health professionals. So I went to someone who I thought, um, who I knew helped some other businesses. But the truth is, I didn't really know what I wanted from them. And I had a whole different range of prices. What I had was very confusing. When I started with the virtual receptionist, I still was doing the four days at, at the clinic and sorry, the um, one day at the clinic. So I had different prices if you saw me in clinic, because my justification was, well, I'm paying for this expense. It was in a really nice place in Melbourne, more overhead. So I had more expense if I was at clinic. You cost more if I was doing genetic testing rather than just a normal consult and all these different price structures. and. To be honest, it confused everyone. It was very confusing. My advice is keep everything simple. I'm not sure what Dan and Cara say, but <clears throat> now I have an hourly price, a half an hourly price, that's it. <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether you're seeing me for genetic testing or just a follow up to assess your supplements. So I've realized that the admin support for me was confusing because I just had so much going on. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, they were expensive and um, yeah, now my husband manages all of the admin and I guess he's quite direct with me. He's my husband, but he basically said, you know, things have got to be simpler. And since then I have put together, because I'm not having, I'm not expecting him to know what the admin people are. I've provided him with templates so people get letters about what to expect, what the costs are, that letting them know they're going to have to, you know, spend more money on lab tests. So when people um, inquire through my website or inquire to the admin email, which goes to Ryan, they'll get a letter letting them know what they're in for. So then they make that decision. Do they want to come on board or do they do they not? Um, I don't have any direct pay, uh, contact with the patient until they it's, it's time to sort of see them. Um, and that has worked really well for me because time is precious. And I, um, Dan was talking about those 15 minute consults. I might, I'm thinking about doing things differently and starting some programs. I might do some pre 15 minute chats and start reaching out to people because I want to change my model and I think that works to bring new people in but at the moment um, up until now I haven't done any of that because I wasn't looking to expand I was I've got enough people and I'm just trying to manage my time so you can go to the next one if there is a next one I think that's it unless there's, unless there's something else you'd like to add Denise um yeah, I guess I did say to you that I really wanted to talk about the environment stuff. Um, I just want to yeah. mention that as much as this, you know, is difficult for everyone, um, I just wrote an article that an editorial has been published and I really focused a lot on the environmental side, you know, not having the planes, not having the cars, not having all this pollution. Um, I think we're giving Mother Earth a little break and particularly as functional medicine doctors, people that believe in environmental medicine and the impact of chemicals and toxins, I really hope that and I think a lot of people will, will start to think about the way they live and do things differently. Um, because I think if all of us make small changes, we could really um, make a big difference in the environment. And, you know, from a, from a perspective of outbreaks, if we continue to live the way we are, particularly with deforestation and, you know, ruining the, the habitats of certain animals, 
um, you know, we're stressing them out. They all harbor all these pathogens and bacteria and viruses. But like humans, when our immune system is weak, so if these animals lose their home, lose their food source, they're stressed out, these pathogens are going to be, you know, they're going to get sick. And then we, that can then transfer them to us. So the sicker we make the animals in the environment, the sicker we're going to get. So we mm. need to make some changes so that um, we can reduce this happening, you know, less, we, we can sort of, it'll be less likely to happen in the future. Thanks yeah. for the reminder. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right, everyone, can you hear me? If you can hear me, please just write um, yes in the, is my chat box open there? Let me see, if, if, make sure people can hear me. I've now turned my mic off. Um, I have to say I apologise for my voice in that I was actually still a little bit sick. We can hear you, thank you so much, thank you. Yes, coming through. Um, yeah, I was still a little bit unwell. As I said, we're all a bit well, uh, unwell after coming back from New York. Um, I've had some um, messages, uh, um, questions come through from Hong Kong. I'll start with these and then if anyone else has um, more questions, I know that um, Paul said right in the question box, I've got both open so I can see questions and chat. The first question was, what are your go-to vitamins and minerals for immunity? So. Um, Without a doubt, I say A, C, D, and zinc. There's obviously quite a few um, other things, but they would be the first things I, I think about. And there are a lot of the um, things that I've been talking to people about over the past few months. I mean, with A, we're thinking about vitamin A supporting our mucosal membranes. It's important for you know skin and gut health. And when we think about infections that come through sort of the nasal passage, or with our lungs, um, we want to make sure we have healthy mucosal membranes. So vitamin A is something that is very, very important. Um, so that's something that I've been talking a lot about. Um, it's one of those things that's hard to test. For those of you listening to that, you, you, the, the webinar, you've heard me say that I do a lot of testing. So often when I'm dosing um, or giving someone their sort of prescription, if possible, it's based on, on levels, whether that's done through um, a blood test or sort of organic acids or something, I'll, I'll get some indication of what their levels are. But with vitamin A, it's very difficult to test. So I have to go on symptoms um, if they're having issues with sort of night blindness. So as it's getting a bit dark, if they're having issues seeing, if they're having some skin problems, if they do have um, chronic respiratory infections, if they're getting a lot of colds, perhaps there's something going on with vitamin A, that's vitamin D too. Um, so, you know, a standard dose, um, you know, you're probably thinking somewhere between um, 1,500 to 3,000 IU, um, but when we're coming to immune support, you probably want to go higher than that. You don't necessarily want to go higher for much longer, but, you know, getting up to um, 10,000 IU um, in times where you really do need to support the immune system. Of course, with vitamin A too, we need to consider um, if um, someone is considering pregnancy or if they are pregnant, obviously, whenever we're talking about dosages, we're, we're thinking about um, the patient. And I'm, um, you know, saying this because you're all, or you're all practitioners listening to this, so obviously have some education on, on um, dosages and considerations. The other one, without a doubt, is vitamin C. Vitamin C is so important. I'm someone that does a lot of travel. I can't afford to get sick. Um, you know, I'm speaking. So I actually um, travel with vitamin C. My personal preference is liposomal vitamin C. Um, however, most of the research when we're talking about colds and flu and immune support is around sort of just the, 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 more, just the oral vitamin C, not the liposomal. There's not as much research with the liposomal. I do know of one paper, if anyone's interested, I can I can give this to the organisers. There is a nice paper sort of showing that liposomal is um, absorbed a little better. People are likely to have higher levels, but it's not as good as IV vitamin C. So there's a, a paper that actually compares oral uh, liposomal and, um, and the IVC. So I like liposomal C. Um, again, when we're thinking about dosages, um, 
generally, you know, a standard dose, you know, a daily dose that's, that's safe is, you know, around that sort of thousand milligrams. But during times of, um, you know, high stress and, and, and you're worried about infections and immune health, you can obviously go higher than that. I definitely know there's some experts amongst the, um, the, the team there in the Philippines. I'm sure they could answer some really specific questions about dosage. But um, just to give you a bit of my personal experience recently with us, you know, being unwell, um, I didn't get as sick as my husband who was in bed for about three weeks having sort of respiratory issues and had some uh, viral infection. And, you know, I was taking one to 2,000 um, milligrams of the liposomal, a couple of teaspoons, it's a liquid um, sort of three times a day. So I would never usually have that much. It was only for one week. So sort of hanging around that three to 6,000 milligrams and I was able to tolerate that. But I, I personally am not comfortable to advise that much to a patient. Um, I do know that some people are a lot more comfortable doing that, but that was just you know my knowledge and what I wanted to do because I knew that I needed that help and I was a little bit sick. Um, and, you know, with vitamin C, a bit like magnesium, you can um, think about bowel tolerance. You know, if you have too much, you will get gastrointestinal symptoms. I often say that with magnesium with my patients too, titrating up. Um, but again, we only want to be thinking about high doses for a short amount of time and if someone really needs that. And obviously, there's been a lot of, you know, changes, a lot of things going on and people, some people are really needing to support their immune systems at the moment. Vitamin D, uh, I probably don't need to say much now. I'm sure you all know how important vitamin D is. From a genetic standpoint, vitamin D actually turns on a whole host of genes involved in the immune system. Um, and, you know, standard doses for me are around 1,000 to 5,000 IU. Um, this is something that I do like to measure. Um, and I, I, if you have the same, I know in America it's different here when we measure um, vitamin D, we have nanomole, basically trying to get your patients up over 100 nanomole. There's evidence to show that's when it really helps support the immune system. Zinc is also a really important one. Um, generally, I'm thinking, um, you know, standard dosage of uh, between 15 to 30 milligrams, but in the times of really needing acute support, sort of up to, to 50 milligrams, but I wouldn't do that for much more than a week. So um, and to be honest, I don't usually talk much about high doses. For those of you who some of you might might know how I'm generally speak, I, I sort of just give more general information, but I think um, all the questions, so this was a general question about vitamins, but the questions that I've been getting over the last month are exactly this, um, you know, vitamin A, vitamin D, questions around dosages. And I'm happy if anyone wants to put anything in the chat with feedback um, that I can share with the group if you want to comment on that. And there are other things as well, many herbs, um, curcumin or turmeric, ginger, things like that. But um, the go-tos, which is what the question said, would be the A, C, D and zinc. The other one is any, the, the, the next question is any specific recommendations for children and dosage? Um, if I'm thinking about children, generally it's still the same things. Um, the only difference is with my children, I will use the um, uh, Sambucus nigra, you know, that, that elderflower, the black elder. I use that as, as like a natural cough medicine for my children. But generally, it's the same things. You just need to consider dosage, which is in the question. The way that I um, work out the dosage is generally by weight. So um, there's that Clark's rule. So um, generally an adult is classed as um, weighing 70 kilos, maybe a bit different in some of the Asian population. There's lots of smaller smaller adults, but in Australia, um, the way we do it is an adult is classed as 70 kilos. So if you have a child that is 35 kilos, you would generally dose that to be half the amount. That's half an adult. So whatever the adult dose is, you give half. So that's, I generally do it through weight, but we also in Australia have the, um, the NRVs, the nutrient reference values by NHMRC, which is sort of similar to NIH in the US. Um, and they provide a lot of information around safe upper limits. They're generally very conservative, but you can access that information about upper limits as well. The next one was how long should one stay on immunity supplements? That question really depends on, 
I, I guess it's good, actually, I mentioned all the, the different things about dosage at the beginning. If you're on standard dosage, doses, excuse me, of, um, you know, vitamin D, like a thousand IU a day, you can be on that for quite some time. That's, that's very safe. Um, I suggest if you've got a good doctor, definitely, um, you know, getting some, some testing done. But if you're on sort of these standard lower doses, then you can stay on these things long term. Of course, you still do want to work with a practitioner, things like um, vitamin D or fat soluble. It could possibly, um, you know, build up. Same with vitamin um, A, unlike vitamin C that's water soluble, you excrete it. But the high dose, and I think I might have already, you know, um, answered this at the beginning, the high doses you generally do not want to stay on long term. And it's always best to be working with, you know, a doctor and a practitioner. So if you are suggesting these higher doses, your patients have come to you, they've got some mild symptoms, they think they're getting sick or, or you, you, you diagnose them with an infection and you really want to boost their immune system, um, you can recommend these higher doses, but, um, you know, use, use your knowledge that, you know, for me, it might be, say, a week or so. But also, if for some reason they are staying on these things longer, you know, having blood levels can really, really help um, monitor that. So, so I guess the short answer is um, if they're just sort of low doses, standard doses, they can be on them for quite a while. But the higher doses, you definitely want to monitor them um, or make sure it's short term. The other question I have is for the three highs, as we call them in Hong Kong, blood sugar, BP and cholesterol, so blood pressure, um, blood sugar and cholesterol, what do we need to be looking out for um, in specifics to their susceptibility to infections? Okay, so I guess, you know, if, if someone has these metabolic issues, we know that that can impact on their immune system. So if someone has um, metabolic disorders, that's meaning that means their body's not functioning as well as it should. So they're going to be more susceptible. Um, what I would say, and something that I haven't addressed so far, so I'm glad this question's here because we don't just want to be talking about supplements. We need to be talking to people about their lifestyle as well. And I think it came up throughout the webinar, you know, sleep, stress, um, you know, good food, et cetera. Um, so anyone that would have, you know, has these metabolic disorders um, or abnormalities, hopefully this is a good time for them to sort of reassess what they should be doing because a number of people are living life on a lot of medications with a number of metabolic um, sort of health issues and perhaps not addressing them um, or taking them as seriously as they should. But now that we've had, um, you know, all this sort of whole change in the last however many months and we now know that people that have metabolic disorders are much more susceptible to infections and likely to have more severe symptoms. Um, hopefully those people will take these things like high blood pressure, metabolic disorders more seriously. And what I would say is think about all the basics that I'm sure you know, diet, exercise, weight loss, um, improving sleep, trying to reduce stress and getting their body functioning as it should. Um, of course, we can bring in supplements as well, but really addressing all those lifestyle factors um, so that they get well from a, from a biochemical level, from a cellular level, um, and then their body's functioning as it should, and they should have a more robust immune system. So that is it um, from the questions. If there is anything else, please feel free to ask me. I'm here to answer any of your questions. Um, perhaps even if there are some more after the webinar or anyone thinks about, um, I know that some people will be listening to the recording, they couldn't make it. Um, if there's a question or two, I'm happy to, to look at those a bit later as well. So thank you all for listening. I'll hand it back to Jessie and talk to you all soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Furness. Um, I would just like to thank everyone for attending tonight's webinar. Um, I thought it was fantastic, so thank you. Um, and as always, we appreciate your time and attention, and I hope that you found the information shared beneficial. I know that I did. Um, for anyone who didn't have their question answered, please just follow up, and we will make sure to get your question to Dr. Hermes um, to get a response back for you. 
Um, and I believe that is all. Thank you again. And I hope that everyone has a great evening. Thanks, guys.